Welcome to our talks. I'm Salwa Mikdadi. I'm uh, on the faculty of the Art History Department at NYU Abu Dhabi, which is very close to here, our neighbor. Uh, the last two decades witnessed a historic shift in the circulation of art, creating several major centers in this region. And the art market played a significant role in the development of the art and art institutions in the Arab world. The Gulf states and the UAE in particular have experienced major activities in the art market that proved to have a significant impact on the region's art. This year's Art Talks offers three-day convening of panel discussions that examine the role of the art market in the rise of governmental, corporate, and private museums, art foundations, collections, and biennials, and art fairs. Speakers will explore the art market's impact on the relationship between the artist, the curator, the art institution, and the newly established local and global art institutions. Regional and international experts will cover issues such as the region's adoption of international market practices, averting the circulation of art fraud, the restitution of looted art and artifacts, the challenge of moving art across borders in conflict regions, and how decisions are made regarding art valuation and collecting. This is our Knowledge is, uh, this is to our knowledge, the first convening of, uh, that takes a closer look at the art market in this region. There may have been other um, panels, but uh, never a dedicated three-day conference that deconstructs and looks closely at the art market and its operation in this region and beyond. Both Dr. Neda Shabut and I would like to thank Abu Dhabi Department of Culture and Tourism and its di director of the art fair, Dialan Sebe, for inviting us to organize these sessions. I want to also thank the speakers for taking time from their very busy teaching and work schedule to be with us. And, and so uh, we really welcome all of you here and uh, happy to meet some of you for the first time after reading your books. We also want to thank the art fair staff, Michelle, Mary V, Dana, and others, and in particular my students at NYU, Valentin, Kristalina, and Mingo, who have been very helpful and worked really hard uh, with me on this. Uh, there are three sessions today and Friday, followed by two sessions on Saturday and two opportunities on Friday and Saturday for a one-on-one -on -one portfolio review by RISD's Emeritus Professor of Painting, Professor Holly Hughes. Also on Saturday, the first steps, a program will offer emerging artists special sessions led by inspirational speakers, along with group workshops on how to navigate the art terrain, offering advice on the first steps into the art market and their career. Uh, the convening will close with a screening of the recently released film, The Price of Everything, directed by Nathaniel Khan, and followed with a discussion uh, that, with the producer Jennifer Stockman uh, and Leili's, uh, Leili Mohammadi. Uh, the film cast in, uh, includes Gerhard Richter, Jeff Koons, and Larry Poons. This is the first screening of the film in the region, uh, and it was co-sponsored by the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. So for now, I would like to uh, um, uh, introduce the moderator of the very first session today, uh, Leili Sreverni Mohammadi, who is currently completing her PhD, and I should say almost done, in sociocultural anthropology at NYU New York. Her doctoral research is on globalization of Iranian art and its circulation between Tehran, Dubai, and London. So help me in welcoming Leili and thanking her so much for taking time to, at this juncture in her writing, to be with us today to moderate the first session. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the first panel of the first day. 
Uh, the title of the panel today is Traditional Art Institutions and the Rising Number of Biennials, Commercial Art Events, and Independent Curators. We have three esteemed panelists who I have the pleasure of introducing. Uh, so I'll give a brief introduction and then we'll kick off their talks and then I'll be leading you through a Q&A discussion at the end. Dr. Bruce Altshuler is the Director of Museum Studies Program at the Graduate School of Arts and Science and Professor of Museum Studies at New York University. He's the author of the avant-garde exhibition, New Art in the 20th Century, and Isamo Noguchi, editor of Collecting the New, Museums in Contemporary Art, and co-editor of Isamo Noguchi Essays and Conversations. He's published numerous essays, uh, on modern and contemporary art, including catalog essays for exhibitions organized by the Whitney Museum, the Carnegie Museum, the Japan Society, and the Vitra Design Museum. He is a frequent contributor also to major art journals, including Art Journal, Moose, Art in America, and Manifesta. Following Bruce, Dr. Catherine Brown is a lecturer in art history at Loughborough University in the UK. Educated at the universities of Oxford and London, she's the author of numerous books, articles, and essays on 19th and 20th century French art, modernism, and contemporary art. Her books include Women Readers in French Painting from 1870 to 1890, Matisse's Poets, Critical Performance in the Artist's Book, Matisse, A Critical Life, and as editor and contributor, The Art Book Tradition in 20th Century Europe, Interactive Contemporary Art, Participation in Practice, Perspectives on Degas, and Digital Humanities and Art History. At Loughborough University, Catherine Brown leads a research group on museums, markets, and critical heritage. She regularly presents her research on the art market, conferences in the US, the UK, and Europe, and is the series editor for Contextualizing Art Markets for Bloomsbury Academic. And Dr. Stefano Baia Corioni, excuse me, is an associate professor at the Social and Political Sciences Department of Bocconi University in Milan. Also a visiting professor at IMT Luca in the PhD Heritage Management and Development Program. Lecturer for the Scuola Superiori del Patrimonio of the Italian Minister of Culture. His research activities concentrate on the transformation of cultural and arts production systems with a particular emphasis on the global contemporary art environment and on heritage policies and management. His most relevant publications are Mercanti dell'Opera, a history of the evolution of the Italian operatic music system in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and Cosmopolitan Canvases with Ola Velthius on the globalization of contemporary art markets. He served on the advisory board of the Italian Minister of Culture and is currently on the board of Piccolo Teatro Milan, National Pinacotec of Brera, and the Fondazione Ratti in Como. He is also director of the Fondazione Palazzo Te in Mantua. Uh, so we will kick off with Bruce's first presentation. He will introduce his paper. Thank you. Excuse me, I must find the clicker. As I was preparing for this talk, I realized that this is the sixth time that I've spoken at an art fair. I mention this not to highlight my own activity, but because the widespread inclusion of talks and panel discussions at art fairs points to a recent important development. The extension to the nonprofit, the nonprofit, the for-profit sphere of programs and projects associated with museums and other not-for-profit institutions. Um, to discuss this, I'll start with some philosophical and historical background and then move on to the present. 
at the first place that I spoke about 15 years ago at, the, at Art Basel Miami Beach, I mentioned what seemed to me a platonic model governing the status hierarchy of the art world. According to such a scheme, the highest position is held by art historians and critics, those engaged most, most intimately with ideas, with lower levels descending through museum curators who deal with the display and preservation of artworks, dealers and other members of the trade engaged with financial transactions, <clears throat> and finally down to the artists, those closest to the base materiality at the low end of Plato's spectrum of value. My comments were greeted with some skepticism, a reaction that I completely understand since this ranking does not at all reflect the power dynamics of the art world. But I now also see that skepticism as quite prescient. Looking forward to our current circumstances in which this hierarchy of valuation has been significantly flattened. We find examples of the flattening or mixing of this value structure in a range of phenomena, including conferences such as this one. While talks and panels have been held at art fairs for quite some time, there recently has been a significant increase in the number and centrality of such events, which include serious lectures, discussions, and symposia that deal not only with developments in the art market, but engage theoretical and historical matters generally addressed in more academic settings. Fair has also been sponsoring curated exhibitions and commissioning works of contemporary art in programs analogous to those more commonly associated with non-commercial institutions, hiring well-known curators to organize them and offering tours, as many museums do. Let's see. And we find mega galleries mounting what are undeniably museum quality shows in museum side spaces. operating research and publication departments similar in scale to those of many museums, and commissioning scholarly essays from important academics and um, curators. Of course, the commercial art world always has depended on academic scholarship. And for many years, commercial galleries have mounted important historical exhibitions and have advanced scholarship in many fields of art history. Projects that depended on significant expertise within the galleries as well as on outside experts from museums and academia. But the connections and fluidity of, ro of roles between the for-profit and not-for-profit spheres has been increasing. These are critical aspects of a qualitative change in the relationship between these two realms. Areas of artistic and institutional activity generally thought to be regulated by very different values. This presumption of different values governing for-profit and not-for-profit domains has a long history, and one that is especially clear in the context of exhibitions. Let me just cite a few historical examples. Oh, sorry. The public exhibiting of contemporary art often is traced back to the French salon system. The first salon was held in 1667 with the show for the court of work by members of the French Royal Academy and it developed after the revolution into a huge exhi exhibition open to the wider Parisian public. Exemplifying a platonic value structure of the sort that I've mentioned, the French Academy was founded by court artists attempting to distinguish themselves from artisans. An opposition to what were considered lower forms of artistic production would remain central to its self-definition. Hostility to commerce was a critical part of the Academy's ideology. And this attitude created a deep ambivalence toward the display of their work. For exhibiting artworks seemed much too close to displaying goods for sale. Following several years of resistance um, to requests for an exhibition, <laughs> excuse me, the clicker is falling apart. The artists of the Academy only agreed to mount regular exhibitions after being pressured to do so by the Prime Minister of Louis XIV. 250 years later, we still see this suspicion of commerce on the part of the guardians of high culture, this time in the context of the museum. In the early years of the Museum of Modern Art, the founding director, Alfred Barr Jr., planned a great Picasso retrospective, a show that would establish the new museum as a model for the scholarly display of modern art. 
But in 1932 in Paris, there was a large Picasso retrospective organized by Gallery Georges Petit, a show installed non-chronologically by Picasso himself with fascinating groupings of his paintings. Because of this exhibition, Barr delayed his own Picasso show, wanting the MoMA presentation to avoid the taint of commerce that he believed would come with its being held so close in time to a major dealer organized effort. Alfred Barr finally presented his Picasso retrospective in 1939. In this early refusal by MoMA to hold a major exhibition for fear of its being associated with the marketplace, we see the affirmation of an ideological model of institutional autonomy from commerce, one based on expertise and judgment that purportedly is independent of the market. Of course, we can debate the degree to which this claim to purity is an illusion. But it is, it is important to understand that it was a view employed at that time in order to establish the public credibility of the new Museum of Modern Art. Another example raises the same issue of public credibility in circumstances much closer to our own context. In 2010 at the New Museum in New York, Jeff Koons curated the exhibition Skin Fruit from the collection of Dockey's Zonu a trustee of the museum and a major collector of the artist's work. Critics, critics vigorously questioned the propriety of the museum's mounting an exhibition devoted to works owned by one of its trustees, selected and installed by an artist for whom he was an important patron and friend. But the new museum and many museum professionals saw little problem here, pointing to the essential role that private collectors play in building museum collections and in supporting museum exhibitions. While criticism of skim fruit centered on the notion of conflict of interest, it also is, an, is important to understand the situation in terms of the platonic value system and its association with the concept of institutional purity. For however unrealistic, we expect museum decisions as to what to exhibit and what to collect to be made for reasons of artistic worth considered apart from matters of finance and influence. And such, a, and such a presumption extends to biennials and other non-commercial institutions, as we see in the statement last year by documenta artists calling for the exhibition to resist becoming a commercial enterprise, and in the stated intention of the Berlin Biennale to be independent of the art market and collection interests. At the same time, however, I think that attitudes and practices are changing. And this seems more than just accepting as inevitable the tensions that come with operating in an environment of diverse interests and values. In other words, the complexities of the real world. For I believe that there also has been an attitudinal change involving a more symbiotic understanding of the art world as a whole. Consider, for instance, the recently announced collaboration between New York's Drawing Center and the Fries Art Fair. The arrangement calls for the Drawing Center's new executive director, the highly respected former, former MoMA curator, Laura Hopman, to be the curatorial advisor next year for Spotlight of Fries, New York, and for Fries Masters in London. The partnership provides some financial support for the institution and will, as Hopman says, promote the Drawing Center's mission and programs to international audiences. But more interesting, I think, is their statement that this, collaboration, this collaborative work with galleries will facilitate deeper art historical research and yield new art historical narratives, both, go both goals of traditional and current museum practice. For me, this collaboration suggests the possibility of increasingly reciprocal and symbiotic relationships between for-profit and non-profit institutions. Relationships that should be understood as more than matters of convenience or mutual advantage. Reciprocity between the commercial and non-profit arenas is part of the very structure of the art world. And we also can see this clearly by looking at the educational sphere. It might seem too obvious to mention, but the university study of art history supports the practice both of those working in museums and of those in the trade. And it's no coincidence 
the, the fastest growing art historical field is the study of contemporary art, the arena, the, the area of greatest market expansion. In fact, it's a relatively recent phenomenon that graduate students were permitted to write theses and dissertations on living artists, for art history was supposed to deal only with the distant past. But now, such advanced research within the academy is commonplace, and it supports research being done in galleries and auction houses, as well as appearing in their publications as essays and catalog entries. Whether it's consultants or in in-house research departments, which now are to be found in some of the largest galleries, Graduate students and recent PhDs do rewarding work in the for-profit sphere, employing the knowledge and skills that they develop in programs of art history. Similarly, graduates of both museum studies and curatorial studies programs have taken the conceptual and practical competencies developed there to meet the needs of the expanding art market and the growing ambition of its exhibitions and programming. And just as art fairs have done, Galleries have developed lecture and discussion programs, along with the blogs and podcasts that provide educational enrichment going well beyond commercial promotion. Excuse me. The fluidity of these forms is accompanied by the movement of individuals. As we have seen with graduates of art-related educational programs, moving on to perform similar functions within the nonprofit and for-profit spheres whether in museums, biennials, galleries, auction houses, or government ministries. Fluid, fluidity of personnel, of course, has had moments of high visibility, as with Julia Payton Jones last year moving to Tadeus Ropak after 25 years at the Serpentine, or Charles Swamara Smith joining Blaine Southern after being head of the Royal Academy and director of, the, of London's National Gallery, or in 2007, Lisa Dennison going to Sotheby's after 29 years at the Guggenheim. And there have been explicitly curatorial moves, such as two young curators recently transitioning from Cleveland museums to curatorial ro roles at Matthew Marks and at Pace. There's been movement in the other direction as well, from commercial establishments to museums and other not-for-profits. This all makes complete sense, of course, because it really is one art world an art world that is becoming more fluid and in many cases less concerned with previous barriers. And we've seen this breaking down of borders in the creation of museums by collectors, private institutions devoted to the display of works for the public, and many of the program, with many of the programs and amenities that we expect with more standard museums. In the US, significant early development Thank you. In the US, significant early development was in Miami, where a number of collectors opened their own spaces in an area at that time without a major contemporary art museum. In repurposed buildings transformed in the 1990s by Don and Mira Rubel and by Marty Margulies, outstanding works were made publicly available in a city that would become increasingly involved with contemporary art. Other dramatic, privately funded museums would follow including in Los Angeles with Eli Broad's Dramatic Museum downtown and the former Masonic Temple repurposed by the Marciano Art Foundation. And a couple of months ago, outside of Washington, D.C., we've seen the vast expansion huh, excuse me, of, the, of Glenstone, a dramatic private museum showing the collection of Mitchell and Emily Rails. And very importantly, such private collector museums have developed active educational programming in collaboration with museum professionals. So rather than always considering the nonprofit and commercial arenas of the art world in terms of opposition, which is a legacy of the platonic model that I've emphasized, I think it often is more useful to look at things in terms of a symbiotic system in which institutions and diverse agents function within a churning field of activity. In such a framework, the cross-sector movement of individuals and the spread of public programming, discursive activities, and curatorial practices are readily intelligible. Looking more broadly, the art world is embedded in larger systems of ideas and relationships for which economic and geopolitical developments create the critical conditions. 
we see the influence of these factors in new forms of art making and in the call for new art historical narratives involving the study and exhibiting of work from previously marginalized groups or ignored geographical areas. And the need for the art world to respond to these pressures is central to our moment. While this is another and much larger story, I think it best understood and dealt with by looking at things in the more global, networked, symbiotic way that I've suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. It's wonderful to be part of these, these wonderful art talks. Um, I'm actually going to start my talk with an artwork. It's a work by Russian conceptual artists and husband and wife team Ilya and Emilia Kabakov. It's a large-scale installation from 2001, and it comprises the last carriage of a train that's heading not just through space, but through time. Along the top, in red lettering, is the text and indeed the title of the work, Not Everyone Will Be Taken Into the Future, and that's repeated in different languages. And left behind on the wooden platforms of the station are discarded paintings and drawings. As you can see from one of the artist's preliminary sketches, some of those works are framed, others are just rolled up papers. They've all been abandoned, deemed irrelevant, in contrast to the unseen works on the train that are being transported for the pleasure of future generations. In their description of the work, the Kabakovs summarize the central question posed by the piece, and here's what they say. What will happen to artists and their works in the very near and not so near future? How will they be accepted and understood by the new curator, the new viewer of the future, the new art critic, the new collector, and so on? So from the Kabakov's perspective, the installation communicates one of the most pressing problems facing artists, namely knowledge and its mediation. Who will have the right conceptual framework to interpret my work? But there is, of course, another aspect to that issue, and that relates to the metaphor of the train in the installation. And the issue is one of power. It's not just a question of which artists get taken into the future and whether or not their works are understood by future publics. Rather, it's a question of who has the power to take those decisions. And that brings me to the subject of this talk. Who's driving the train? Who's answering the questions about aesthetic value that determine the future of art history. Now this session, organized by Salwa and Nada, concerns topics that I think are crucial to today's art world. The mediation of knowledge about art, the relationship between the market and institutional practices, and the creation of histories of art. Every art fair, biennial, or museum we go to is in some sense creating a future by virtue of decisions taken as to the artists who are or are not exhibited, which works are deemed interesting or valuable, and what art is considered worthy of safeguarding for the benefit of future generations. Now, you might say, well, look, there's nothing new in that. Questions of value have always had to be determined, and art history is full of good and bad decisions. Let's face it, when the French artist Gustave Caillebotte tried to make a bequest of his collection of 67 works of Impressionist paintings to the French state at the end of the 19th century, the Committee of National Museums turned down many of those works, including these paintings by Cézanne, Monet, and Manet. But I want to suggest to you that we're actually reaching a tipping point in museum culture and about how decisions concerning value and the preservation of cultural heritage are being made. And the reason for that is the proximity that's developed between museum culture and the art market. So for the remainder of this paper, I want to think, and I'm developing some of the points that Bruce has just made, I want to think about some of the links between museums and markets and the future of art history, and to consider some of the risks and opportunities that are facing curators today. Recent scholarship on the art market has focused on the creation of transnational knowledge networks and the convergence of strategies for the promotion of artists. And indeed, a few years ago, I put forward the idea that the art market is a kind of knowledge economy 
in which a multiplicity of agents can disperse information and hence power within the art world. The starting point for that was my response to an argument put forward by a professor of aesthetics at City, the City University of New York, Noel Carroll, in an article on art and globalization published in 2007, Carroll argued the following. He said, what we're witnessing now differs from the past insofar as what we see emerging is something like a single, integrated, cosmopolitan institution of art, organized transnationally in such a way that the participants from wherever they hail share converging or overlapping traditions and practices at the same time that they exhibit and distribute their art in internationally coordinated venues. Now, Carroll meant that idea in a positive way, hence his stress on cosmopolitanism, on the identification of ideas that we can share regardless of our personal or cultural backgrounds. For Carroll, art fairs and biennials, coupled with tourism and curatorial mobility, promote the flow of information between artists, curators, institutions, and publics. The result is, he argues, that we're all equipped with the concepts to understand and interpret works of ambitious art. Ten years later, though, that idea seems unhappily reductive. The ideal of a globally shared interpretive framework has turned into a convergence of interest on a restricted group of artists and expressive styles, a brand of art that's promoted as the most financially valuable and therefore worthy of making it onto that train that's heading into the future. As Ian Robertson puts it in his recent book, New Art, New Markets, we've ended up with a formulaic cultural Esperanto, understood by an elite, an elite art world insiders who inhabit a homogeneous global culture. To take one example, on a stroll around Manhattan in 2017, you might have seen Jeff Koons' works in the Guggenheim, in the Whitney, in the Museum of Modern Art. And that would have been followed by a sight of his public sculpture of a ballerina at the Rockefeller Center, and then topped off by the storefront of Louis Vuitton on Fifth Avenue, showcasing Kuhn's designed handbags. So in that case, a shared interpretive framework seems more like a conflation of luxury goods, branding, and museum culture. And keep in mind that at the time that the ballerina was displayed, Kuhn's balloon dog, Orange, was the most expensive artwork by a living artist ever to sell at auction, having achieved a price of $58.4 million in 2013. So in my view, we need to look very closely at the relationship between the art market and museum culture and the ways in which ideas of aesthetic value are being shaped. In their book that examines the dynamics of Art Basel, titled When Art Meets Money, Franz Schultheis, Erwin Singler, Stefan Egger, and Thomas Mazzurana catalog some comments by collectors at Art Basel. In that sales forum, collectors claimed to be in the presence of art that was the best, the highest quality, and incomparable, because the works were of high market value. Their comments echo a statement made in 2006 by Tobias Meyer, the then worldwide head of contemporary art at Sotheby's, that, and I quote, the best art is the most expensive because the market is so smart. In other words, if it's worth paying for, it must be good. And that's an idea that still comes to the fore in art market discourses today. But we need to make a distinction between taste and value. It's easy and uncontroversial to say that collectors lead the taste of other collectors. In their book, Collecting for Love, Money, and More from 2013, Ethan Wagner and Thea Westrich Wagner note cases where the acquisition strategies of a well-known collector have influenced the buying decisions of other collectors, a tendency that was recognized by the gallerist Mary Boone in 1982 at an exhibition in which the names of collectors were shown alongside the works they bought. But tracking collecting activities and following the rising or falling stock of an artist isn't intrinsically different from examining any other kind of consumer behavior within a particular asset class. The knowledge that that generates is knowledge about the market, not about the art, despite Meyer's attempt to draw a connection between financial price and aesthetic value. The more pressing problem is the extent to which collectors play a crucial role in determining what objects are considered worthy of intellectual, institutional, and historical interest by audiences across time periods and geographies, and indeed by museum curators. 
As Sebastien Montebonel and Diana Vive worryingly put it in a report published in July of this year, as a consequence of dwindling public funding for art, commercially prominent work is becoming the norm in public and private museums, as well as galleries, bringing quality and financial value ever closer. Put another way, the market is eroding curatorial and critical independence. It's taking over from museums in determining what art gets taken into the future. A study undertaken by the Art Newspaper in 2015 revealed that between 2007 and, 2000, uh, and 2013, solo exhibitions at major museums in the United States featured artists represented by only five commercial galleries. The study shows that market dominance has become museum dominance, and that's problematic in light of the biases relating to gender and ethnicity that are apparent in the marketing, sale, and collecting of art. Added to this is the increasing critical proximity of museum and art market culture, as Bruce has just mentioned. Gallery publications and auction catalogs are high-end production with detailed research, but it's research that's geared to promote specific artists or products. Private gallerists also stage shows to coincide with public museums exhibition, and they often give financial support for exhibitions by state-run institutions. In return, museums are recognized as places of validation for an artist's work in ways that help to bolster that artist's market value. Take Britain's, oops, yes, take Britain's hugely, oh, we've lost a slide there. Take Britain's hugely successful David Hockney retrospective of 2017 has had a positive impact on the artist's market price, as acknowledged by Alex Rotter, the chair of Christie's post-war and contemporary department. Uh, and the work in question that I would have shown you um, uh, by, by Hockney, the portrait of the artist with the man swimming in the, in the swimming pool is actually coming up for sale tomorrow, uh, offered without reserve in Christie's post-war and contemporary evening sale, uh, and that might make Hockney the most expensive living artist, so watch that space. To take another example that intersects more with history than with contemporary art, within an 18-month period from late 2016 to the present, fans of Pablo Picasso could enjoy the following exhibitions dedicated to the artist. Uh, his portraits at the National Portrait Gallery in London, an exhibition about his imaginary voyages at a museum in Marseille, I won't list them all, works on a theme of cooking in Barcelona, works from a single year, 1932, in Tate Modern. Currently, a show that's ongoing at the, the Musée d'Orsay, a show dedicated to Picasso's blue and rose periods, and then also a range of commercial gallery exhibitions, including Larry Gagosian's Minotaurs and Matadors exhibition in London with a named curator, the famous Picasso biographer Sir John Richardson. Now, I'm happy to admit that Picasso is a great artist, but that's an astonishing level of international museum dominance for one artist within a compressed period of time. To the extent that Picasso's works have been taken into the future, they've not only come to epitomize a high point of 20th century European modernism, they've also got bankability for museums. And of course, these repeated exhibitions do more than this. They reinforce a particular narrative of 20th century art history, and they bolster the market value of Picasso's works. Picasso's portrait of his partner, Marie-Thérèse Walter, estimated at 36 million pounds, was sold by Sotheby's for nearly 50 million pounds in February of this year. According to reports, four other Picassos were purchased for a total of 73.8 million uh, pounds in the Sotheby's auction, following on from more Picasso purchases at Christie's the previous night for around 40 million pounds. Now, in cases such as this, museums and markets reinforce each other to generate and communicate a combined notion of financial and aesthetic value, as indicated by the inclusion of asset tracking information about Picasso on Sotheby's website. So as, in, as attention turns increasingly to the monetary value of art, whether for investment or entertainment, the result is increasing cultural homogenization, where museums and markets promote the same artists and interests. And I want to mention one final point on that issue. You'll be aware that museum exhibitions have corporate sponsors. And in the cases I've just described, Ernst & Young was a major sponsor of the Tate Picasso Show, KPMG and ING Bank, among others, are sponsoring Picasso Blue and Rose at the Musée d'Orsay, and Picasso's portraits at London's National Gallery, National Portrait Gallery, sorry, were sponsored by Goldman Sachs. 
so the other related question we have to ask here is for whose benefit are museums crafting their exhibition agendas? Don Thompson gives a rather depressing answer in his 2018 book, The Orange Balloon Dog, and here's what he says. For museums, the most important customers are not potential museum goers, rather they're the donors, in the same way that the important customers for newspapers are not readers, but advertisers. As every MBA student learns, to find out what business an organization is in, you ask, what's the revenue model? Where does the money come from? The revenue provider is the customer. Well, if that's true, then we should just all go home. Um, museum culture's at an end, and our global art world is simply a space for trading an asset class that is called art. But hey, I'm an optimist, and I don't want to accept that conclusion. So coming back to the question I posed at the beginning of this paper about who's driving the train that leads us into the future of the art world, right now I think the answer is the art market. You'll have gathered that, in my view, that's problematic because the market is concerned with issues that do not, or at least should not, coincide with the mission of museums, which, at the very least, is to conserve a diverse cultural heritage for the benefit of future generations. If dealers and auction house professionals are interested in maximizing profits that can be derived from artworks, that's not necessarily a problem in itself, but it does become a problem when it impacts on questions of aesthetic value when it erodes curatorial independence, and when it shapes museum collecting and programming. So what can we do? Can curators regain their independence? Can museums be encouraged to take risks in their exhibition programs? Well, problems of funding are clearly relevant, and if museums are appealing to funders who want, to, who want control over exhibition strategies, then they're clearly not incentivized to take risks. But if the mindset of those funders and other stakeholders can be changed, if audience pressure can prompt an uncoupling of museum culture from the market, perhaps we might be able to reinvigorate our art world. What kind of things might that take? Well, first of all, I think we need a greater critical self-awareness on the part of museums who should be asked to problematize the very act of collecting and canon formation, as well as exhibition programming. We need museum boards who are willing to back the independence of their curators. We need donors and funders, both private and state, who are prepared to invest in museums without strings attached to those funds. Greater attention needs to be paid to the diversity of museum stakeholders, i.e. the fact that there's no single public, but rather a whole range of micro-publics who visit and should be encouraged to visit museums. New governance structures for museums with, for example, public representation on boards. Why should, public represent, why should there be representation just because I'm a billionaire donor? Uh, if we're appealing to the public, then let's give the public a say in the actual governance of our institutions. A plug for academia. Closer ties between museums and academic scholarship. Academics have long been posing questions about collecting the social role of museums and prejudices that have shaped art historical narratives. And finally, let's not forget the artists themselves who need support, particularly in the early stages of their careers, and who can develop links to the museum industry through things like funded residencies and workshops, rather than relying on dealer representation. Now, if many cultural institutions lack sufficient funds to be progressive in these ways, do new institutions in the Middle East have the opportunity to move beyond existing paradigms and to reconceptualize the role of the museum in the 21st century? The Louvre Abu Dhabi is showcasing cultures from around the world and demonstrating both distinctive forms of cultural expression and points of intersection between them. But smaller galleries also have the potential to have a major impact and to foster international dialogue. The Frank Bowling exhibition currently on show at the Sharjah Art Foundation is taking place in partnership with the Haus der Kunst in Munich and the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin. Art Jamil is partnering with the Met in New York and the v &A in London. And it'd be great to see more exhibition transfers and partnerships with the UAE that promote this kind of exchange. The potential scholarly impact of increased cross-border collaboration and display of works of, uh, of, by artists from the Middle East in museums abroad is, I think, also important. At a time when Anglo-European scholars and curators are questioning key art historical terms, such as modernism 
and are seeking to understand how their own critical concepts can be challenged by works from a wider selection of traditions, a broader perspective is recognized as essential to that. So exhibitions such as the Hassan Sharif exhibition at the Shah Jah Art Foundation last year, or the Fateh al Muraris exhibition currently on show at Mataf in Doha, offer perspectives on modernism and surrealism that can help to reshape dialogues about the history of 20th century art. So in a sense, like Noel Carroll, I'm also searching for a kind of cosmopolitan ideal in our art ecosystem. But crucially, that doesn't mean that we need to share the same discourses and critical frameworks. And in fact, I think it's important that we don't. So I want to conclude with another temporal metaphor from we move from future to infinity in the shape of one of Yayoi Kusama's infinity mirror rooms. What I think we need as we gaze into this open-ended sphere of art, and what I think we have a right to demand of our museum culture, is that attention be paid to a diverse range of voices and perspectives that are independent of the market so that we can make up our own mind about who makes it into the future. We can legitimately ask to be surprised, provoked, entertained, educated, and challenged by museums. And it's by supporting an independent museum culture and curatorial freedom that I think we can secure an innovative and diverse art world in the 21st century and beyond. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I, th I think that uh, the presentation that has been given now is anticipating uh, many of the theme that I try to develop in my, in my presentation as well. And I, so I think I will, in a sense, reshape a little bit my, my conversation with you because uh, some of the point that has been raised, I think should be discussed because they're crucial and relevant. Because I think that we are here because we all think that art is important. And, and, and there is an advocacy hidden in, in your presentation, which is basically the advocacy for, a, for, a, for a, an ecology of the art system that, in a sense, allows the art to, to preserve its integrity and its relevance, in cultural relevance, in, in, in the shaping of humanity, which is basically uh, the naive point, which is un underneath all our discourses, a little bit naive in relationship to what is happening in the market and in general in the system, but I think that we should keep this naivete a little bit alive in our practices. And, and I have to say that um, I have been Thank you. I have been a, a scholar of the art market and then since Two year and a half, I'm directing a museum, and I have to say, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult job. So I, I perfectly understand uh, the kind of intertwinement that is obviously practiced at, at the global level. So I will go very fast uh, through, um, let's say, a presentation which is, in a sense, delivering some numbers about what have been uh, conceptualized uh, before. Uh, when I started my research, I, I had a talk with Seth Sigelau, that ob you obviously know. Uh, and Seth uh, presented uh, in 2013 at, at Art Basel a, a kind of provocative conversation that, that began with this question, what makes a great artist? What makes a great artwork? Beauty, emotion, content, originality. Basically, he was, he was developing an inquiry on the arbitrariness that he was feeling uh, in the art system about the way in which the art system was legitimizing or delegitimizing artwork values and, 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 and let's say, trajectories. And um, in a sense, I, I had a conversation with Ansel Kiefer once uh, at a dinner. Uh, and, and I asked him something about the art system, and he answered me, the art system is nothing. The art system doesn't, doesn't I don't mind about the art system. Does, the art system is not a reality. It's something that passes away. The art will stay. But then, of course, it's Anselm Kiefer that is telling this. So it's somebody which is at the peak of the art system, right? So it's a kind of contradictory. 
so I think that we need to have a, I thought we need to have a photo of the art system. So what is this? The dots are the artist that has been exhibited in Basel from 2005 to 2013. And, 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 and the square are the galleries. And then you have other figures which are museums. So you see that galaxy that give you the idea of the dimension we're talking about, more or less 7,000 artists that has passed into the engine of Art Basel. And, and what is the first thing that we might notice here? Is it, is it, is it, uh, is it uh, a game uh, of equality or a game of inequality? It's a very hierarchical game. We have a, a clear hierarchy. It means that the, the dots that are the central part of the galaxy are the artists that everybody wants to have in his rooster. And the other here are the ones that are only taken by one gallery, for example. Let's take the same images on museums. I've, I took 35 global museums. You can see that. You see, also in the museum, you have more or less the same images. The, system, the art system is highly hierarchized with, with stratification of marginal, average central, and central artists. The, dot, the red dots that are in the middle are artists that has been exhibited in almost all of those museums that you look at. And the position of the Kunsthalle Zurich means that Kunsthalle Zurich exhibited all of them. And it's Beatrix Roof that you probably know. So um, I ask myself, how can I use this image in order to have a better understanding of, uh, about how the art system is working? Because probably we, we are having trajectories, right? People that are starting from the outside and become more central, and people that are more central and go outside, or people that just stay where they are. And these trajectories are relevant not only because of the fact that those artists are shown by a higher number of museums and galleries, but because this implies a process of legitimation and historicization of their works. So the consequences of this trajectory may be relevant. So um, I jump on, on, on the conceptual part. Uh, what, what, I, what I did is, um, I collected the trajectory of 7,000 artists, uh, 480 galleries, and 32 international museums. And I tried to plot, these are examples of plot. I just took nine of them on 6,000, right? I plot the centrality level. So you see the red line are artists that are at the relevant tree is, uh, high level of centrality, average level of centrality, low level of centrality. You see that the artists that are central tend to stay central, basically, all along the timeline. Then you have some of the average that are going down, some of the marginal that are going up. So what I traced are those trajectories in the career path of the artist. And I came up with some kind of studies on that, on that, on those trajectories. Um, I made some selection. Basically, what I understood is that the upward transition are produced by the fact that the artists enter into central gallery portfolio. So it's not that a gal that an artist become more let's say, presented by a higher number of galleries, not only this, is that he is kept by a central gallery. So this means he's going up in the centrality within the gallery system. So we, if we look at the gallery system and we ask ourselves, what is happening to an artist that become more central? The answer is he is cherry-picked by a central gallery. And if we count those events, we basically see that 29 gallery 
on the total of 437, which are, rep which are representing 500 artists on 2,000 artists, are involved in the 32% of the upward transition and 57% of the downward transition. So that means that we have at global level 29 gallery that are the one that will tell if you are or not a good artist or a very good artist or an artist that is worth to be part of the global system, of that rhetoric of the global system. So you have a, a relatively small magic circle of actor at global level that are deciding the destiny of those trajectories. So the second question that I raised myself was, what is the role of museum in this process? Do the museum act as, let's say, independent rating agency? So maybe the museum are balancing the power of those 29 because the museum are acting, negotiating with them a little bit, right? Like, like a healthy financial market or financial system. Therefore, I looked, I looked, I only took the artists that went sharply up and the artists that went sharply down in those processes. So I isolated uh, a smaller number of artists, a group that went up in the central part of the system, a group that went down from the center to periphery. Asking myself, what happened in the museum environment? Is the museum environment reacting exactly at the same time in the same direction as the gallery system or not? And this is the answer. This is the plot of the artist that went down. The plot in uh, show you the connection between the museums and the galleries. The blue are the gallery, the triangle is a museum, and the artists are the gray dots. These are artists that went a little bit in the periphery of the system in the period 2005-2013. And you see, they do have exhibition in museum, but those exhibition are mutually independent. Now let's see the same figure for the artists that went up in the same eight years, so in the short term. You see? What does it mean? It means that the museum and the gallery act together even in the short term. They are acting like the birds that are migrating in, in, in the fall, right? If somebody likes somebody, as in, 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 a, in, a, in that peculiar moment, I mean, short term, eight years, is, is nothing. But they act together. So that means that the system is unstable because you don't have this kind of independent rating agency which is acting against the decision of, of, of the commercial dealer. They are going together. So the next step of the research as I'm finishing because it's a very complex edit. I don't really know what I looked at. I mean, it's, I'm trying to figure out what I am understanding in the process. It's very complex. Um, is to say, okay, what, who come first? Is this convergency produced by the museum or is it produced by the galleries? Who is leading the game? Who is who, who is the conductor of the train, right? I suggest that we don't have any conductor. That's, that's the problem. We don't have any conductor. Anyway, let's look at some phenomenologies of these processes. This is um, an artist. This is set price. I can talk about the set price. I think you know set price is a very important artist, celebrated. So this is the set price network that we reconstructed uh, all along, uh, to almost 20 years of a career. In the early time, let's say 2001, 2003, we had a couple of very important art institutions like the MoMA that went into the set price 
um, um, exhibition and, and, and life. And you have a, a, more, a relatively small and uh, important galleries, but relatively small, like, uh, like Amy Fontana or Green Naftali at that time. And then you had the Whitney Museum Biennial that exhibited, so some relevant biennial. And you see 2005, 2007, the growth is bilateral. So you have an increasing number of galleries, an increasing number of museums. There are an increasing number of biennials that are involved and take the work of Seth Price. Then you have 2009, 2010. The process is still going on, but now Seth Price, that was a relatively marginal artist in Basel, 0.005 centrality degree, become more central. 0.23, because, because he is taken by big galleries, by important galleries. So in this moment, he is taken into important galleries. So he's becoming more central, and this process is going on now. You see? This is the way in which the system include and develop the historicization of an artist with such a cooperative effort. Is it related to the auction prices, to the market? The first graph is um, the hedonic regression on the prices sold in the market on set price work. That shows that until 2016, it was growing very fastly. So there is a high correspondence between the, 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 the convergence of the attention and the market price. But then in 2017, it, it drops. In 2018, this is a, only a partial, so you don't have to look at it. The interesting part of the story is the second chart, which is explaining the sale volume. That means the liquidity of the asset of the work of set price. And you see how this liquidity is increasing even before the peak of prices. So the interesting part of the story is that this, uh, this convergency of, of agents produce liquidity of the market. So it's not only necessarily a matter of high price. It's a matter of the presence of somebody that want to buy if you want to sell liquidity of the market, right? Let's take another case. I, don't, I will not tell the name. So this is an artist starting 93, 95 with some small uh, interesting galleries and museums. You see the number of, of galleries increase at the end of the 90s. It increases in the early 2000s, and then it decreased in 2009-2011. Okay? What is the story of this artist? The story is that the artist is having not enough selling. We are unable to develop any kind of statistical analyze on his prices, but in terms of liquidity, you see, set price was selling, if you look at set price, was selling $2 million for each year turnover. This artist is selling uh, $40,000 each year. So it's much smaller liquidity, much less interest of the market, and at the end, a lower number, lowering number of exhibitions. So the signs are telling us that in the case, in the second case, the difficulties in playing a role in the market is breaking the alliance. So they work together. If the market reacts positively, they go on working together. They work together. If the market does not answer positively, the alliance began to be a little bit more problematic. So I'm not saying that the market is leading, but the market is a relevant test in the process. 
And that's the point. That's the crucial point. We are entering into a phase in which the market affirmation is becoming a source of legitimation for the making of art history. In the short term, not in the long term. During the, the, the artist's career. Shall we work against this? I don't think that we can work against this. I think that we need to, to understand, first of all. We need to understand. We are at the beginning of the understanding of this process, right? But we need to be aware of the reality. And probably to train the artist to be able to cope with this reality. That's it. Thank you. Now, yes. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. I think um, what strikes me to begin with is we have this kind of reflection, both of where we come from, where we might go in the future, and sort of where we are now. So I think you, between you all, we get this overview and this thought process of how to consider everything that's gone on. Um, and I think Bruce was very helpful in, in allowing us to think how that's a, it's actually a philosophical position, right? To, to, to begin to believe that art and money in the market should somehow be separate. And that you're giving us the perspective that actually that's, that's an impossibility at this point. So I wonder if, if we could speak a bit to Catherine's optimism, <laughs> or if you both might share some of that optimism, or should we see this pessimistically, or should we see this simply as where we are at this point in late, late capitalism in which none of these things really can be separate. And I think also from talking about this from the perspective here in the UAE, in the Middle East, in which the situation is not necessarily that we have this long history of, of museum culture in the same way, and so things can actually be growing more sim, uh, symbiotically. Uh, yeah, so I wonder if you could all speak to those things. Is this one on? Yeah. Hello? Is that on? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'd like to start by defending my, my optimism because I think that your, your paper was very cynical. <laughs> you, 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 you sound very cynical about, and indeed the way you just couched that debate as to what we can or cannot do. Um, I do think that the market is, is driving the train and I actually think that a lot of the work that you've just, you know, the statistics you've just quoted support that view. Uh, I think a lot of it comes down to simply how we're and whether we're funding museums properly. Um, as soon as we start to withdraw the, the funding from museums so they become ever more reliant on sponsorship and on art market decisions. So putting money into museums I think is key. I also think it's interesting to look at some of the discourses around the new museum culture that's developing here in the Middle East. Uh, a lot more emphasis on communities, on community spaces, on education really reverting to what we think museums should be doing anyway. So maybe a different funding model that's emerging here, uh, which was what I was hinting at at the end of my paper, actually gives us a, a kind of blueprint for other things that we might be doing in other jurisdictions. Uh, but I do think that we can do something, partly through funding and partly through trying to reorient what we think museums are trying to do. So there's, there's yeah. my optimism. I, I, I partially share. Uh, it's important for me to clarify that I don't, I don't buy the, let's say, Adorno-like position that the market is able for some reason, right? So uh, I, I don't buy. 
um, I, th I think that we should look at the thing as they are, first of all. And, that, and that's the, the, most, the first important thing. That means that, for example, if uh, I, I, I want to understand how to help the Italian artists to, be, to become more global, I need to understand that we have 29 galleries at world level that are the ones that are deciding the trajectory. I, I need to know. I need to know the name. I need to understand how to help them in being in contact because this is what is happening. These are the gatekeeper. I mean, and, 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 and this is true also for the people here. I mean, if the artist here wants to have a relationship with this global system, obviously it is not an obligation. You might stay a very good artist here without having any relationship with the global system. But if you want, obviously you need to take care of that. If you are a museum, if you are a museum, you cannot be independent from that system. Because I, I, I used to, to say, oh, we need to correct them, we need to fight against. But then, when I managed the museum, which kind of exhibition I did in the last two years and a half, Tacitadin, Gera Richter, uh, Morandi, yes, because the people come to see those exhibitions. And, 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 and I want to talk with the people. And, 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 there it's, and it's, I, I'm not saying that I didn't do something else at the same time with younger artists, but it's not sustainable, right? I need to be sustainable. So this is a challenge that needs to find an ecological remedy. That is one that you suggest. So in a sense, I agree with you. Yes, we should introduce some small, small, careful, let's say, ecological, like not consuming in order to uh, uh, enlarge our uh, uh, footprint, right? I mean, it's, it's something like an ecological care, but the system is working in this way. We are not changing that. Well, I, I think actually a lot of the um, recommendations that Catherine was making are things that, in fact, are happening. I mean, you, so, it's a slow process, but I don't see it ever like sort of the market's here and museums are there. Because really we are talking about, as you say, like a single ecology. And if you look at museum acquisitions in terms of actually the museums I'm familiar with, I mean, there is a lot of acquisition of things that are sort of out of the mainstream exhibition circuit. Museums are catching up. They are attempting to, at least in the U.S., acquire areas that were sort of ignored in the past, younger artists, et cetera, the issue of smaller arts organizations doing what they're doing. I just, um, I mean, what I was talking about was really descriptive, I mean, what is happening, not that sort of I'm recommending this, that, or the other thing. But I think we all kind of in our heart want sort of the, sort of whatever system is at work to yield interesting, important, rewarding art for our institutions and for the public to see in whatever venues. I mean, if you just take art fairs, I'm really not sure what the audience here is, but at least the art fairs that I'm familiar with um, are very broad kind of audiences. They're not solely consisting of buyers are not solely consisting of dealers. They are kind of venues for presentation. Yeah, I mean, uh, just, a, just a couple of, just a couple of, the art fair are part of this. This is the representation of what the art fair produce. But this is our basel, right? Here we have a big problem, not here, I mean, generally speaking, with the art fair which is the sustainability for the galleries to go around in such a way. And, and this is almost impossible, right? So we are distinguishing the, the big galleries that can do that. I mean, galleries that have more than five, $500 million turnover. But then the average gallery are in, in a big problem, I can tell you in this moment. The smallest gallery can survive because they, they don't have fixed costs. But this, is, this model is, is, is a model that will have a limitation in the future. Second, 
just to say, this is the rule of the game. If you want to help an artist, you have to collect it and then maybe operate donating some of the, his work to the big museum because this will be part of the game. And that's it. We need to, if we want to help an artist, we need to put him with Marian Goodman and on the other side with, with, uh, with, with, some, with some important museum. This is what is happening now. Maybe, I don't know, in the future. Remember, 30 people. Uh, I just wanted to change the subject a little bit, and that's to focus on the role of the contemporary, because contemporary art has now become so important, um, both in terms of driving the market and in terms of interpreting history. It used to be the case that people turned to history and looked at historical art in order to understand the present. Now it's reversed. Um, you think of exhibitions such as Tracy Emin uh, and William Blake, pairing, another pairing that's coming up at the Royal Academy in London, uh, Bill Viola and Michelangelo. You talked to, uh, to me earlier about Gerhard Richter and Titian. Um, so people are using the contemporary as a filter to understand the past. And I think that also feeds into, oh, and of course, the way in which some of these auctions are being framed and what's making it into contemporary, uh, modern and contemporary art sales. So again, it, it brings attention to the contemporary art market even as a lens to understand and mediate history. And I think that's significant. Well, I, I mean, that's certainly the case, but I tend to look at that situation as one of the use of the contemporary to bring people into museums to shows that they would not otherwise be coming to. And similarly, uh, just, just the use of the contemporary in general and the sales, the contemporary sales, to integrate historical material into that to help the market for those historical objects. So it's like, right, right, right. Well, bolster the market for things other than the contemporary through the notoriety of the contemporary. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so very much for this um, extremely useful, informative, sad, happy, you know, um, discussion. I feel like I'm going to ask the obvious question that may be on the mind or should be on the mind of many of, of um, uh, our you know, people who are sitting here. So in all the examples and all the museums that you have been talking about, clearly, you know, they're very Euro-American-centric. Euro in terms of galleries, artists, and the trajectory. But of course, we are sitting here in Abu Dhabi at the Abu Dhabi Art Fair, and we do have a sort of a phenomenon that happened recently, particularly as the contemporary seems to be the window, the opening into the art of the region, that we have prices of artists. The market you know, has been so unpredictable of how the prices go up and go down for the Arab artists. Could we perhaps sort of try to talk about this a little bit if you have any comments on that? That would be great, thank you. Not to put you on the spot, but. What I saw, uh, what I saw is that um, the, the relation, the center periphery relationship, let's say, in a brut very brutal term, are basically managed by the presence of a bunch, of very few galleries that in each country are the ones that are delegated in managing the relationship with the central part. So you have independent systems, let's say, that are rolling Brazilian or the Croatian or I would say also the Italian. And, and, and then you have three, two, four, sometimes four galleries that are oligopolistically, they say, managing the relationship with the central system and bridging down the artist from the central system to the collector of the country. So there is an exchange there. And it is clearly signed by the kind of action that they are doing. So they are selling American artists in Brazil and they are putting Brazilian artists to America. It's an exchange. So I think that this will happen. This is happening also in China. This is happening also here, I think. Thanks, and I think you raise a, a, gr a great point, and it's one of the things that I was trying to, to get at when I was trying to dismantle that idea of a single integrated sort of 
monolithic notion of, of the art world. Uh, and I do think we have moved beyond that. And I think it's also noteworthy of noting that this is a point that Ian Robertson is making in his book, New Art, New Markets, that there is no longer really a center and periphery. And then in fact, as we see the staging of art fairs in these different locations, there is an increasing emphasis on local production, on local artists, on distinctive cultural voices. And that that is actually one of the most interesting things about what we're calling our art ecology today. But that's a, a real change. Uh, from the past and from the values that have been promoted by this notion of a globalized art world. I think we're beyond that now, thankfully. Um, and it's time to, to enjoy something different. So I think that, that, that looking at these different examples of art fairs and dealers that are promoting artists from the regions is actually one of the most exciting and, and potentially reinvigorating ways forward. Uh, no, um, um, I agree on the fact that we have a very articulated system, so it's not a monolithic. It's not. It's never been probably. But the point is, if you accept to operate in a in a in a in a system or in a subsystem, let's say, which is basically not necessarily connected with another macro system, which is more let's say globalized, more globalized. If you accept not to be known, apart from a, from a small bunch of uh, connoisseurs that goes around, that obviously are curious and go everywhere and understand, so you are locally known. You you, you work in a, in a in a situation which is local, and that's it. So it's not necessarily bad or worse, but it is like this. So we have a star system which is enacted. We have a star system. Why, why should we deny the fact that the art is organized in, in a star system? It's boring. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's boring. It's boring change Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely. But it, we can only change it if we actually do something. Um, so I don't want to sit back uh, and wait for that. Nor do I think that you end up in a subsystem or you end up marginalized from you know, this star system um, by, by showing in in different art fairs that, that have an emphasis on particular cultural discourses. But, but if, if we're buying into the idea that museums also play a role in that, then museum partnerships and the representation of artists by galleries, by museums, you know, can lead to international exposure, can diversify our art discourses, and can diversify our art ecology. It's not going to happen overnight, but it can happen. I, th I think there's... There's something else certainly in this context that perhaps you're speaking to, Nado, which is in partly a, an interest in contemporary art, then encouraging an interest in more historical, right? And in writing more of that canon and in looking where there has been a lack of resources. So in some ways, the market that kind of is, is, is predatory and looking for newness on some level from one side of the world actually encourage then some some kind of deeper historical research and some and deeper production of that knowledge. So it's not we can't say it's necessarily a, a negative thing in, in that perspective, I think. Um, I think there's a question, two yeah. questions here. Um, um, I've been for 20 years a small gallerist from Beirut on the margin of the margin. And uh, for a long time, I was very pessimistic about how the, I believe the market was leading the art scene. Until 2006, when uh, after the exhibition of Jeff Koons at Saint Pompidou, the president of Saint Pompidou was removed, and uh, because uh, there was a big debate in France. But I must say, I've, ever since, I am more and more optimistic, and I would like to thank the three of you because, in fact, when I listen to you, I feel there is a a, a huge bigger awareness about how the art scene functions. And in fact, the more there is an awareness about how it functions, the more, as you said, there is an independence because the, the art scene has checkups. I mean, if the museum plays the independent role, if the publishing houses, the, the, the independent publishing houses and the art critics play their role, etc. then uh, the, the phenomenon will be very well balanced. But for a long time, it was not. It was completely driven by the money. 
and I was uh, very happy to see that at least there are three people today who understand how it functions. So thank you. Uh, thanks so much to uh, Saleh for uh, bringing up the word optimist. I was actually thinking that pessoptimist is sort of what I left <laughs> uh, um, this panel uh, with by way of impression. So kind of pessimistic optimism, and there still <laughs> seems to be a tug and pull in terms of how people are, are interpreting what just unfolded. And I guess I have two questions for you. The first is, um, uh, if I were to respond uh, to this very provocative presentation by uh, uh, Dr. Stefano on um, the notion of what sort of functions as a status signal, right? So certain galleries uh, are essentially able <laughs> to carve out a central space by which a certain group of artists remain privileged. And that sort of, if I've understood your presentation correctly, over other artists that don't have that gallery representation. And that goes hand in hand with museums. That was the central part of your argument. And I guess my question is, are there other kinds of status signals that we can think about? So things like um, residencies or prestigious fellowships or something that essentially enable artists to kind of bypass what you are describing as gatekeepers. Uh, the second question that I had actually for all three panelists uh, was um, wh what, what is there an alternative way to think of a metric? So for example, I've really heard that essentially uh, the cost of the art piece is what's defining whether an artist is successful or not. Whether the artist is being shown in galleries and their work is being sold and recognized by museums. But are there other metrics that the art world uses to evaluate what the contribution of this artist is? So for example, participating in I don't know, grassroots collectives, you know, to um, create some sort of, I don't know, let's say social change or a turn in the kind of discursive space in which the artist functions. Are there other ways to measure if an artist is, has truly made a contribution beyond simply whether their artwork has sold well or not? First of all, I don't think that those uh, central are evident in any way. I mean, they are simply central, and, and uh, they are stronger. They have more power. They have more responsibility uh, in terms of, of establishing certain tra certain path of, of careers. Um, I may add uh, another pessimistic sentence, just for discussing with you. Uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that we have uh, a, a star system enacted into the uh, contemporary art is interesting. Also, if, if you think on the researches that have been made on the music art system, so they ask themselves, uh, which is the criterion for having uh, a big hit in the music system? And you know what is the answer? Random. Okay. So the, art, the, 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 the art star system functions in this way. But then, obviously, we have other, other parts which are balancing this action. I'm not saying that it is not. So we have resonances, we have possibilities of co coexisting, coexisting with this system. You mentioned randomness, and, and this is going to lead me back to the, to the question. I'm not sure it is entirely random. Uh, the thing that worries me about the market is the role of systematic prejudice. For example, sexism or prejudice as to where an artist comes from, what background they've got, what ethnicity they are. Um, you know, you look at the statistics about gender and dealership representation and they're pretty stark uh, about the privileging of, of you know, Anglo-European white men. Um, so that I think plays against the, the whole randomness point. Um, and it brings me sort of to, to your point about status markers and who's deciding what and how we, how we deal with that. And I come to a kind of many minds theory. And we can take a many minds approach. If we just listen to the market, we're listening to, to one very small group of people. We need to listen to more people uh, in order to make better decisions and to give artists opportunities. So yes, residencies, yes, workshops, greater educational opportunities, 
exhibition opportunities outside the, the gallerist, the dealer, the, the dealership um, milieu. Uh, and only, I think, through doing things like that can we move away from a certain conception of what an artist should look like, how they should behave, and you know, what, what we think of as a great artist, whether contemporary or historically. So a many minds theory, I think, is what I'm aiming for in order to, to answer your question. Well, I think the, you know, it's a very slow process of changing a system that's existed in this way for so long. And there are pressures towards increasing diversity in terms of kind of the institutional actors, the museum staff, curatorial, you know, competencies diversity of galleries. I think, I think it is changing. I'm no Pollyanna here, but at least there's a lot of pressure within the museum field, at least, both in terms of exhibiting and collecting to increase sort of um, richness of holdings and to increase the um, variety and diversity of those making the decisions. And I think this is changing to some degree. And I think it's a bootstrapping situation where capacity changes, et cetera, you know, around the world. In terms of kind of the, the market for artists in this region, or from this region, um, you know, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slow process, as I say, and, and, and sort of, I think China, which is a very unique case, is kind of an interesting one in this regard, where the market for contemporary Chinese art was very much a kind of international market what collectors were collecting in China was very much antiquities, local things, and that's changed. And there's a growing market within that region. Now, China is obviously you know, a special case given its size. But nonetheless, there was this um, development of a market for its own artists within the country, and I see that as another kind of way to increase diversity. Um, just by way of uh, a closing comment, also something we haven't really spoken about just yet is artists and their own agency in participating in the market, certainly for contemporary artists that are alive today. Um, but I'm sure we will hear from artists uh, in some of the other panels. And also, I urge you all to come to the screening of The Price is Everything on Saturday because that begins to deal with that question. Thank you to all of our panelists, Stefano, Catherine, and Bruce. And thank you all for coming.